Ernie, before we talk about the Yamanator that you've brought here to Mentone, tell us a little bit about the background of Rotor Flight Dynamics and what you set out to do as a company. Well, gyroplanes have been my hobby since 1971. I got out of the Army with no job. I was in Army aviation. I was a crew chief on a Huey, and I got out of the Army in 71, a son on the way, no job, and still wanted to fly. Discovered a Benson dealer just went in business, befriended him. He crashed on the first flight, didn't hurt him, and I bought everything he had, 10 cents on the dollar. Flew the Benson, decided there was some improvements that could be made, and I kept improving through the years. In about six or eight years, I put a bigger engine, which dictated I need bigger rotor blades. There weren't any, so I educated myself on rotor blades and started building them. And as time went on, I uh, had people wanted the blades. Long story short, 25 years later, I got six customers that were willing to gamble on me building the blades, whether they worked or not. They put up the money, we built the blades, and here we are 22 years later and over 2,000 sets of blades and people are happy with them. All right, now the machine it, it, itself, you talked about improving on Benson's basic design. A lot of people who tried to do that wound up with configurations that were not safe. You've, you've kind of become known for the high stance of your machines and the arrangement of the thrust line. Yes. Uh, we loosely call that center line thrust. There's nothing new. The Wright brothers had it on the first aircraft. But as the Benson gyros became mutated with bigger engines with the advent of the Rotax engine, bigger propeller. Bigger propeller meant that you had to raise the engine up. Now the thrust line was no longer where it used to be, but the seat was. It kept uh, getting further and further away, and it make, they become more and more unstable. There was a particular brand of gyro that was extremely popular during the 80s uh, that had this problem, and none of us knew what the problem was, but they were having instability problems that were causing accidents. Uh, I have a good friend named Chuck Beatty, which is probably the foremost authority on auto gyros in the world, unbeknownst to most people, and I've known him for 40 years. And with his help and, and uh, tutelage, we finally discovered what the problem was. And this type of stance was a solution where you raise the aircraft up and put it in front of the propeller. And now there was an, an instability problem. And then by putting big tail feathers on the back, like an arrow, it goes straighter. It's real simple stuff. It's nothing new, but it just seemed like it was a new revelation at the time. All right. Now, this machine, you call it the Yamanator, and I get the joke. It's a Yamaha engine on a Dominator gyroplane. I wanted to ask you about the engine in particular because snowmobile engines being used on small experimental aircraft has a rich heritage. Rotax developed some of their early snowmobile engines into actual aircraft engines. You're back at kind of the early stage of uh, being an experimenter with engines with one that hasn't been designed for aircraft use. Why is this the case? Because there are no other engines available and Rotax having owned the market has, in my opinion, gotten to the point where they're gouging people for the price. They have a 503 engine, a 60s technology. It should be, the first one I bought, I paid $875 for. They're over 5000 for basically the same engine. That's just not right. All right, well, tell us what had to be done to this engine to make it usable on an aircraft, because in the snowmobiles, they have a whole different way of coupling the power output, and they run at different RPMs than what you need a prop to. Well, uh, as you're aware of, there was a man out in Colorado that developed the three-cylinder, and I got talking to him and then was made aware of the four-cylinder fuel-injected engine, and I decided that's what I wanted, and I researched it through the blogs on uh, snowmobiles for its reputation of dependability and reliability, and found it had an exemplary reputation, so I bought one. Uh, and then I have a friend and associate in New Zealand that designs and builds reduction drives, which I've worked with for years. I sent the engine to him, told him what I wanted, he built it. Uh, and it was quite the ordeal to build. And then we had to build a, a very unique engine mount to hold it because the engine has pads that are in different locations on it and we still wanted to get the thrust of the engine, the center of mass and everything all in about the same place. Did that and then <laughs> the wiring was the nightmare. It had, on a snowmobile it has so many sensors for that computer, it's just unbelievable and we had to find ways of tricking the sensors that we no longer use or tricking the computer into believing there's something still there. That took almost seven months, and then when I finally figured it out, the computer died. So I bought a new computer and got it running, and then it got to the point where I could start it, and it would run as long as I held the start circuit on. When I let the start circuit off, it would quit running. And for three months, everyone that I could contact in the world could not figure this problem out. And it's incredibly simple. The starter solenoid had to be turned around 180 degrees, and the wires put on the other side. On all solenoids, on all cars, there is no left and right or, or positive and negative, but on this one there is. And there's nothing in the factory paperwork telling you that because on the sled, it fits into a cavity that'll only fit one way. You can't put it in. It's stupid proof on the sled, but I proved it wasn't stupid proof. <laughs> 
beauty of the Release 9 system architecture is that you have two fully redundant integrated flight displays. Each has access to all the systems and data. Providing full redundancy and eliminating traditional reversionary modes, Release 9 allows either display to be configured as the PFD. Now your failure modes are much more manageable because you can continue to fly with the same familiar display symbology without the need to relearn composite modes you don't typically fly with. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is truly the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology. Well, let's talk about flying this thing now. You've had a chance to, uh, you, were, you were very careful to, to have a disciplined regimen of testing out the redrive on the engine and everything else, and you've only recently opened it up to full power. How does this thing fly? It's, your, your machines are fairly light. Uh, in the two-place world, yes, they are. Um, by design and by desire and, and the selection of engines, I have used Subarus on two-place machines and built the heavy, heavy light machines, not like the heavy heavies, but uh, <clears throat> this one, in testing it, I was very apprehensive about the drive because the manufacturer was very apprehensive about the final gear. He said all the numbers said I had over a three to one safety margin, but in the past sometimes numbers say one thing, reality says another. <laughs> well, how does it fly? It's exceeded my expectations as a single place and uh, I've just started carrying weight, people weight. I've put sandbags in it down in Florida, but I actually started carrying people weight in and it's, uh, it's getting there. I, I believe it's going to be exactly what I want, but I'm only taking little incremental tests, very little tiny bites at a time, and then come back and digest it. I've been at this for 39 years, and I'm still here, so I want to be here the next year. <laughs> well, I, I have to say that any place, especially in the eastern U.S., where you show up at a gyroplane event, you see a lot of your machines, and there has to be a reason. Thanks for giving us some detail on this one, and keep doing it. I will try. I hope everybody likes them. <laughs>